From the studios in Joplin, Missouri, Good News Productions International presents Venture in Faith. Outstanding Christians of our generation telling their own story of how God has worked in their lives. Your host, Boyce Moten. This is a third in a series on our Venture in Faith series with the J. Russell Morse family. Usually we only have one film in a series, but there was so much to say and we're just going to touch the hem of the garment. I want to take you back to 1921 when J. Russell Morse was a new recruit on a mission field way off in Asia and the man under whom he was working was killed by Tibetan bandits. J. Russell, what came to your mind at that time? It came into my mind uh, a prayer uh, of, uh, out of my grief and out of the a sense of loss, I cried to the Lord and said, you have carried this man into the most dangerous parts of eastern Tibet with good news and ministry of mercy, uh, and he uh, actually received an invitation from the Dalai Lama uh, to come to uh, Lhasa and uh, to confer about building a hospital there. Now he is gone. Uh, and Lord, here I am, send me, but where? And the word came back to me in an inaudible voice of the Holy Spirit, I'm sure, saying that if not in inner Tibet, then there are regions on the borders of Tibet, especially uh, to the south, uh, where the people are just as unevangelized and know just as little about Christ and God uh, as the Tibetans. And in these regions where no missionary society has been working before, among these illiterate people, you may have a ministry that will be a demonstration to the Tibetans across the border, along the border. Uh, and uh, I am happy to say today that this vision is being fulfilled uh, because uh, this vision has been shared by one of our grandsons, Jonathan, uh, and uh, as well as other members of the mission in sponsoring and supporting uh, Native uh, tribes people, Christians, uh, to witness to the Tibetans. Uh, and there are a number of uh, Tibetan villages in North Burma that are being reached with the gospel uh, and uh, the people are are being taught. Some of them will already turn to the Lord. So uh, this is truly uh, just another example of how the Lord has fulfilled his promises. And as the scripture says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, there the Lord authored a vision and he has been bringing this to fulfillment. The thought occurs to me that some of our viewers may not be familiar with the Morse family, so I'd like to introduce Eugene, who's J. Russell's son, and you were four months old when uh, your family departed for Asia, and then J. Russell's grandson is Ron, who is on my left, and uh, he was born, wasn't he, Eugene, in Burma? Uh, Ron was born in uh, North Burma, yes. In North Burma, and the family is still very much involved in Asian missions. Now, in our last segment, we talked some about the China work and about moving down into Burma after the Chinese communists took over uh, in, and drove out, I guess, uh, the faithful to the Lord. Uh, one of you fellows pick up the story there. What happened after uh, J. Russell was released from a communist prison? Where did you go then? After a, a furlough of... Uh, a little over a year in the United States, uh, I headed right back uh, to uh, to North Burma. By that time, uh, Eugene uh, and his family, and uh, Robert also, uh, had uh, uh, 
I started a new work uh, on the Putao Plain. No, as Eugene, Eugene and his family were the first ones there. R Robert was at that time, as I remember, uh, in the uh, Diliwaku in the Hukong Valley, uh, way on the border of Burma and and uh, West China. Uh, but uh, Eugene, suppose you take it from there. Well, we uh, some of the folks had uh, fled across from China by overland routes by foot. And some of us had uh, fled, uh, had evacuated from China out to Hong Kong through Rangoon and then back up to uh, North Burma. And at this time, while there was uh, great numbers of uh, refugees, not only from China, but many from the uh, hills that had uh, uh, come down into the plains. And they'd set up a number of uh, uh, new villages. Oh, well, you yeah. see, they, this area has uh, renowned all over Burma as uh, more or less like a death valley because of the very uh, bad uh, malaria uh, that they have there. And uh, uh, in fact, many of the tribes people would hardly even survive one summer. So uh, coming down there, well, we did have an awful lot of sickness and uh, uh, with whooping cough and malaria and various other things, it was really very d difficult. However, uh, we uh, started spraying against the mosquitoes uh, through the advice of American uh, um, aid mission in Rangoon and they suggested what we were to use because they said well that the UN would not be able to get up there that very soon so for us to go ahead and, and use this well it was a British form of insecticide we sprayed and it literally uh, just transformed the health of the whole area we sprayed the whole villages and all lice were wiped out all fleas were wiped out mosquitoes wiped out and uh, uh, and even uh, itch uh, uh, this, which was really a, prob a plague almost, uh, that was all wiped out. And it became literally uh, one of them uh, really healthy places. So uh, then soon after that, while well, we laid out some uh, model villages, and my father, and after he arrived, of course, he introduced the citrus uh, uh, fruit growing program, and that became a real cash uh, crop, and people's uh, health began to improve. Uh, then uh, uh, Robert got, of course, involved more and more into the uh, translating the, of the Rawang New Testament and uh, uh, Rawang Literature pro Program. Uh, and then uh, later Laverne, my brother Laverne, joined us and he, he helped out in the uh, uh, starting uh, Christian day schools. And then, of course, meanwhile, Daddy, Daddy together with my adopted sister, Jama, Esther, uh, carried on in the, in the medical program and uh, folks would uh, travel several days down there and they'd bypass the, uh, the local government uh, clinic up there and come right straight to our place uh, and uh, because we had really a, a, a tremendous um, uh, success in the medical work and then uh, it was really it was a totally undeveloped area which in the through our help and the thousands of Christians that began to come more and more and more until we had over 35 villages uh, uh, new villages started all around the plains there so it was a major migration. In fact, uh, I'd say perhaps 20,000 people came down from the hills. Now the thing is uh, that they, these were all Christians and uh, uh, the non-Christians didn't dare come because they were so f afraid of the health conditions. And then there was another aspect. There were around 3,000 Shans. Now these Shans are very deeply involved in not only Buddhism but in all the voodooism or the black magic, sorcery and so on and they would use black magic to against uh, enemies. And so the, uh, the hill tribes were just uh, mortally afraid of the uh, Shan black magic. They didn't dare come down there. But the Christians said, well, we have nothing to fear from the powers of darkness, so the spirits and so on. And uh, so they came down. Now, it is true that they did have some rather unusual experiences, a number of cases, uh, and it just, just pointed up the fact that God's power is mightier than all the powers of darkness. But uh, uh, the, so here the whole plains were being filled up, the land was healthy, the, the, uh, the sickness problem was whipped, and then we, uh, um, then we uh, along about 1954, why about three, uh, three four years later, why uh, uh, some, uh, a lumber, lumbering a lumberman down out in Oregon do donated $5,000, and we were able to buy one tractor plus some equipment and so on, and then uh, later we were able to get a second tractor and we started opening up the grass plains, uh, just plowing up the, these uh, grass plains that are covered with uh, elephant, uh, elephant grass that would be anywhere from oh, six to ten feet deep, you know. You just go through and plow that up and, 
and, uh, and of course it's quite fertile and it opened up I guess so close to 2,000 acres or more uh, and then from there why then they, they began to get the hang of it and they were carried on from there but this was also a fantastic development too of course we use the tractors for uh, laying out the streets and model villages and so forth well in the development process why um, the public works department uh, sort of relied on us and we got to be really uh, chummy with them and and uh, then we uh, got all the Lisu folks together under my supervision, more or less, and we took out a big uh, contract, and we laid out bri uh, roads and, and built bridges and, and uh, you know, just opened things up that, that way and, and even helped to develop the, uh, uh, the airfield. And at one time, well, of course, we didn't have regular pl plane services yet. They were just landing on the old wartime grass strip. And uh, so we got in touch with the, the uh, Burma Airways down there and says, well, come on, let's have a regular weekly service up there. And they said, oh, we don't have anybody up there and, and uh, they just wouldn't be profitable. I said, we'll, we'll help sell you on it, uh, uh, sell the people on it and uh, we'll be uh, the first uh, uh, agents if you wish. And so I was actually an airline's agent there for several months before they got uh, a man in there regularly. And so we got the, uh, a weekly service started and later on that became a, uh, twice weekly. And, and then later on they wanted to, to develop, develop the uh, airstrip and uh, hard surface it and uh, so we helped out in getting uh, contracts and with, with the Lisu folks working and so on. But you see here's the interesting thing. We were working entirely with Christians. These are literally thousands of Christians and, and there are almost no non-Christians except uh, some of the, there were a few Chinese traders and oh as I say about 3,000 uh, Shan scattered out around the fringes a bit, but uh, uh, basically it was all Christian. So it was one of the, I'd say, one of the most fantastic opportunities for developing a luscious valley, uh, just a beautiful uh, uh, valley there, uh, which nobody wanted, and now it turns into a healthy, uh, just a uh, development area. So uh, the Burmese government recently was, said that the Putao Plains there was one of the most uh, uh, peaceful, most uh, progressive. Uh, and uh, um, uh, beautiful. beautiful too uh, areas in all of Burma, and uh, so it was. We feel really happy uh, that we got got national recognition. <laughs> you know, when Abraham wanted a uh, wife for his son Isaac, he sent his servant back to pay Aram. And there's a phrase in the King James Bible that means a great deal to me. The man said, "I, being in the way, the Lord led me." And someone said, you don't need guidance on a rocket until it blasts off. And some of our viewers may say, well, the Lord has never guided me, and I've never felt the call of God or a guidance from God, and it may be that they've never blasted off. When J. Russell Morse blasted off and cut ties with his family and friends here in America and got out on the mission field, God was really guiding. And as we talk about the work in western China, about the move down into Burma, and as we will discuss in a few moments about the move down into Hidden Valley, in retrospect, we can see that God was really providentially guiding and directing Maybe. and controlling throughout this whole missionary endeavor. Um, J. Russell, maybe you could tell us just a little bit from your perspective about the Burma work and then we'll talk about the transition into Hidden Valley. Well, one thing that I was impressed uh, coming into this region is kind of like the 49ers coming into California. At first, they were just coming in there about to prospect for gold. And they didn't realize the variety of climates and the possibility of raising many different kinds of fruits and vegetables in these various climates. And I got the vision of a similar transformation in this region, especially since Eugene laid out in the development of the with the tractors and plowing the land and the people coming, settling down there, uh, and of, uh, that uh, uh, we would explore around to see what different climates there were, and there were the the plains and the and the low uh, the the foothills, and then higher up in the mountains, a variety of climate as there is in California, and also wild fruits that could be uh, the trees could be used as rootstock in grafting uh, and otherwise propagating uh, some of the uh, very superior varieties. Uh, so I continued the work in uh, North Burma uh, that I had started in West China, uh, introducing uh, fruit trees uh, that I got in from uh, Stark Nurseries in uh, Louisiana and California Nursery Company and 
and from Florida and uh, elsewhere. Uh, and not only 30 varieties of the finest citrus, but also uh, such things as lychees, avocados, uh, and uh, uh, ma mangoes. Uh, a, a, a Buddhist businessman uh, by the name of Ong Ji in, uh, in Rangoon uh, heard about uh, the, uh, my interest along this line, and he said, well, uh, I want to uh, cooperate by sending y you uh, varieties of the finest mangoes that there are in uh, southern Burma that were not introduced yet uh, into uh, northern Burma. So he, m he must have put out hundreds of dollars and uh, days of time in, in buying these uh, mangoes uh, and packing them uh, with all the names attached, 22 of the finest varieties, and I grew them from seed. And uh, one characteristic of the uh, of uh, mangoes is uh, many of the Burma varieties come true to variety from seed, and will have five or six, as many as five or six sometimes trees from one seed. This is uh, really unique among all the fruit trees. Well, that is just one uh, one phase of this work, and it's now estimated that there are. A about a third of a million of uh, citrus trees alone, uh, besides many other varieties of trees uh, throughout all of northern Burma and through over into northeastern India and down to Nagaland. I remember reading in uh, Exodus to a Hidden Valley about the way you had them plant the fruit trees, the kind of a hole you made them prepare. Tell us about that, Jay Russell. Well, this. I did emphasize to them that this is to be the future home of that tree uh, and the, uh, that it was planted in, uh, in hard clay or has only a, a shallow top soil and beneath that is rock, uh, that the tree would not prosper, uh, but uh, they, that is fundamental uh, for the tree to have this, uh, uh, this, this kind of planting. Uh, and, uh, uh, so th these people, uh, there was uh, one man of the uh, Rawang tribe who especially worked with me for five years. His name is Silip Jung, uh, and he is the father of Johnny's wife, Nang Sar. Uh, and uh, uh, he, uh, he was uh, very helpful in uh, helping me to introduce uh, these trees to various uh, villages, uh, and uh, I gradually got from the United States uh, uh, scores, uh, I suppose altogether several hundred uh, po pocket knives and carborundum sh sharpening stones and other things that would, uh, uh, could give out to those who would undertake this uh, work of propagating. The proper season of the year, we would send out cuttings uh, in the uh, and there was plenty of moss there, and you get this moss a little bit damp and uh, pack the cuttings in that and send it out to uh, some of these people who had been trained to do this uh, propagating. And uh, so uh, citrus trees especially uh, have uh, multiplied, and the, when the plains come up from uh, to Putao, for instance, uh, uh, and often must return empty, uh, the, uh, the the women and others who have these uh, fruits to sell will be at the airstrip and uh, send, and there'll be people on these planes that will buy the, uh, the citrus. Uh, and uh, they, they've gone all over Burma. Uh, well, if there's no roots, there cannot be any fruit. You got, and uh, I think that's so important, even with regard to your work, that you've been a generation or more establishing roots throughout Southeast Asia. Not only the fruits, but I saw on one occasion over a hundred baskets, each, each one uh, with uh, uh, a citrus tree in it that was being uh, sold uh, for plantation uh, elsewhere in, in, in Burma. Now, let's move on into this Exodus to a Hidden Valley because as I think most of our viewers are aware, the Reader's Digest published a book about this which was written by Eugene. And uh, in a way, uh, I've talked to the Morse family enough to understand that they really 
the things that most of us American people are interested in is just a side issue with them. We want to hear about a lion or a tiger or an elephant, and the exciting moments when their lives were threatened. And to them, the most important thing is not that at all. It's the preaching of the gospel, the distributing of Christian literature and hymnals. But the one is a vehicle to communicate the other. And perhaps uh, the most famous missionaries that I know, or perhaps among the most famous uh, missionaries of our century, are right here on camera with us today. Uh, the Reader's Digest has how many million copies that are published? Uh, in English, it was 19 million. The total uh, circulation at the that time was about 31 million. About 31 million, and your your book was condensed in That's the right. Reader's Digest back in 1974. 1974, and then the book was published, and it has gone through several printings. About four editions. Four worldwide. different printings, and it is now out of, out of print right now. Uh, it's out of print, but it'll be soon coming. Uh, another edition will be printed. The, the fifth edition will be printed. So. Uh, that was something you didn't ask for and uh, may have resented at the time. But Jay Russell, why don't you take it uh, and tell us about why did you move? Why did you leave northern Burma, which was like a paradise? And you had all the fruit trees and all the Christians working. What happened? Uh, I, I would like for Eugene or Ron to tell about that. But before we go on to that, I, I want to say that while uh, my time was taken every day uh, with the uh, scores of patients in our little clinic in uh, Moladi. My, my wife took it on herself uh, to begin a series of, of teaching uh, seminars in each one of these new villages. Uh, all these, uh, uh, and uh, I, I know of some occasions in which she waded through water that was nearly waist deep uh, and with the help of some of the the native Christians uh, carrying her uh, loads of equipment and uh, and uh, uh, that uh, <clears throat> uh, so she she made it her, her goal to hold schools of three or four days each uh, in each one of these 37 villages and then I remember one time when she was brought back exhausted uh, and she was and out of her mind or should I say it was in her mind, because the, all that she could ask, well, where's Daddy? Where's Daddy? <laughs> well, I was right there. I was in her mind all this time that she was looking forward to our being together again because uh, Jesus Christ had been to her, uh, uh, to me as well as to her, the Lord of all. And I had uh, taken joy in all these years of our married life to serve her uh, because she was serving Jesus Christ with such a self-sacrificing loyalty. They didn't realize that at that time, probably, uh, she paid the price by uh, contracting perhaps the beginning of diabetes, with which she later died of uh, heart complications after we turned to the United States. But uh, the 58 years that we had together serving the Lord as fellow soldiers it is the great shining star in the firmament of my life. She not only taught 37 villages, didn't she also teach your own children? You didn't have any other school, did you? Uh, yes, uh, she taught our children uh, and uh, together we prayed for these children before they were born, after they were born. Uh, she graduated from the University of Oklahoma as a Phi Beta Kappa who had had uh, almost straight A's all through high school and college, and that's what she was for Jesus, uh, was uh, to excel in the quality of living and ministry, and we all uh, are blessed by her memories. Now, Eugene, maybe it would be appropriate since uh, you she were did. the one in the family who authored the book she to uh, give us an introduction. Uh, you see, uh, the Burmese government had def uh, been overthrown in a coup about 1962, and then guerrilla warfare broke out, and our whole area there was embroiled in an uh, anti-government uh, guerrilla warfare. Well, we were caught in the middle. The, uh, the Rawang tribes' peoples uh, sided with the Burmese government. 
the Lisu people wanted to stay neutral. The, uh, the Kachin, uh, which is a, a kind of Kachin tribe, which is to the south of us, uh, had joined with the anti-government uh, uh, group. And so the Lelisu people were then were caught in the crossfire, and one time where the government would occupy a village, and then the next time where the, the guerrillas would come in and occupy, and, and both sides would accuse the people, your side and with that, and, or the, and back and forth, and many people, innocent people, got killed, and it was really getting almost too much. However, we felt that we should stay on as long as possible. So from 1962 to 1965, we were in a, almost a constant state of of uh, w uh, warfare there that, that we just had to sit tight and trust the Lord. So in the meantime, of course, we had uh, carried on a very intensive Bible, tra Bible uh, training programs, uh, short-term Bible schools, and uh, uh, training of both not only preachers, but assistant pre preachers, elders, deacons, young people. And this had been going on for 15 years, ever since 1950, uh, a very intensive tra tra training program. Uh, in the meanwhile, I'd say that perhaps about 80% of the whole population there, that northern Burma area, was, had become Christians, and there were around 400 congregations. Well, by 1965, things had, we were still holding tight, and uh, uh, of course, the, uh, the work there, really, I'd say, is that we, a whole generation of teaching, you know, you really get a pretty strong, st uh, reliable, or mature church there. and. Uh, uh, in the meanwhile, a lot of the people, the Lisa people, wanted to go head west. They said, we just can't stand it here, caught between the crossfire. We want to move out in the jungles. We want to go on over to India, if possible. Well, uh, that would be our new frontier of evangelism. And so we said, well, uh, I agree, we all agree, but let's just hold on until the Lord opens the way. Uh, let's hold on a little bit longer, and then, then if the Lord opens the way that way, why, we will be going. So all of a sudden, here came the uh, order from the... Um, national government uh, and that they just went over the heads of the state government because the state government officials were all on our side and they were they were just uh, standing up for us uh, uh, for these past three years and not allowing the government to uh, order us out but now they just passed over us and uh, over the state government and ordered us to leave within three weeks uh, and uh, so uh, we were didn't know hardly what to do well in the meanwhile then uh, literally when the when the leader the the Lisa Christians heard that we were about to, were being ordered to leave. They said, well, this is it. We're all going to go. We're not waiting any longer. So already about a couple thousand started heading for the hills. Uh, in the meanwhile, we were rushing to get everything ready, and we were puzzled, knowing, not knowing just how to handle it all, uh, I mean, what the Lord would have us to do. But actually, in our departure, the Lord prevented our going out uh, through uh, Rangoon, I mean, out to the, the, the southern Burma, and to certainly directed us in going out into the jungles. Now, I'd say that the main uh, goal that we had in mind at that time was to move westward into a new field of work. And in order to accomplish this, while well, we took along enough supplies, equipment, that, and everything that we could take uh, reasonably, uh, even printing equipment and tools and, uh, and medicine, suppl medical supplies that we had left over and everything. So we actually moved out pretty heavily loaded in a sense, I mean, uh, quite a, with quite a bit of equipment, with the, uh, with the real goal of setting up a new mission station. Now, whether this would be across the border into India and start working among the tribes in India, uh, it would be if the if Indian government would allow us. If not, then our next goal was to move um, out into this unadministered area well, so that we could work among the Naga tribes, which had not yet been uh, reached. Uh, uh, there had been a, just a little opening, but we were hoping that perhaps that would be the next big door opening. So uh, I, I think that the entire uh, group of uh, people that went out with us, they wanted to get away from the fighting. They wanted to get in here and then into this new field of labor. Tell us a little bit about the Nagas, because I understand they are among the most primitive peoples on earth. Uh, yes, they were the most primitive. In fact, as the British administered both India and Burma, uh, and uh, more or less uh, brought it all under uh, government control. Yet this area of Nagaland in northwest uh, Burma, um, this area we're speaking of, uh, which is on the Burma side of the border, but this area was never tamed by the British. It was the most wild, primitive, uh, uh, untamable area of all. And the British referred to them as the, uh, as the uh, naked Naga headhunters naked in the sense that they just wore virtually nothing, just um, uh, hardly as, as, huh, as, uh, as naked as you could probably get by with. 
Uh, and then there were het a wild. Uh, every village was an armed camp. Every male was uh, was a soldier. I mean, in their within their tribal uh, within their tribal system, uh, every village was uh, an armed camp with uh, just with patrols uh, all the time, day and night, and uh, they would go out and do their fields under a heavy guard, uh, even, and they would make raids against neighboring uh, uh, villages. And then we speak about the headhunter aspect. Well, they um, their um, um, religion is animism, but unlike the other tribes people, which you usually would sacrifice a chicken, um, a pig, or maybe even a uh, maybe even a bullock or a cow, um, the the uh, the Nagas would sacrifice uh, human heads. And so in order to obtain these, why well, they would go out on raids against uh, uh, neighboring uh, villages or other tribes or maybe unsuspecting travelers if there dare, anybody dared to travel and just ambush and, and take, the, uh, take uh, whatever heads they could get, you know. I mean, they just, they'd just go in and slaughter, take their heads and bring them back and then use that in um, uh, sacrifice to the spirits. Also, uh, it was a sense of uh, this is to, to uh, uh, show their manliness, I guess. They're the men, were, you know, they, they were capable of going out and taking a head. I think, in a sense, you might compare it to the Indian, American Indians, uh, that would go out on scalping parties. And then uh, I think that scalps were brought back as trophies. Well, in a sense, there was, there was a parallel, I'd say, there. Now, these later on, uh, the, the, even under the Burmese and under the Indians, this uh, center core of Nagaland was never, uh, never um, um, subjugated. subjugated. Uh, they, they were still wild. And right up to this present time, uh, up to the time when we went out in the hills, well, uh, uh, the Burmese government was finally sending in a huge army of, say, 3,000 men that would make a patrol through there. Well, that's all right. As long as they were under patrol, you know, 3,000 of them going through the area, they could get through all right. Uh, that nobody dare attack them. But the moment they'd pass, well, of course, everything revert back to their original feuds and fightings and so on. However, little by little, the people in there were beginning to uh, uh, give up their old ways. And uh, we heard that almost kind of funny. They said that uh, they didn't take heads anymore, but they would borrow the old uh, skulls uh, from way back, and they'd borrow them back and forth and back and forth and sort of, you know, kind of fool the spirits, this sort of thing. So uh, it that was being reduced. Well. Then this uh, whole program of uh, what you might say um, uh, independence army, you know, the, the, the Naga people had been fighting the Indians. Well, then uh, that same uh, theme, that same uh, spirit uh, was uh, developing on the Naga land on the Burma side, and they started to uh, develop a, an independence army on the Burma side to resist the Burmese. Well, now these, uh, are these actually the independence army was led by really uh, educated people that had come in from the India side. People had been to England or been abroad for college and so on, and I mean, they were really top flight people that had been trained by Baptist missionaries that had worked with the Nagas way over on the India side. Uh, the, now, now they, they themselves were penetrating their own land, but they were, of course, always at war, so this was really risky. So uh, uh, these uh, same men, they'd, they'd recruited uh, uh, quite a, a little army, and uh, while we were there in, Naga, in uh, this hidden valley, why well, here came a, an army of 600 Nagas, under, under uh, the officers were cr Christian and were, uh, had been trained abroad, too, but uh, uh, they, they came through with this army of uh, about 600 had been recruited from this wild area. So they came through there, and uh, my father and mother were right on the river, uh, on the, the main, the, uh, the main uh, riverbed there, uh, on a, in the little village there by the main uh, crossroad there. And uh, so all of a sudden here one day, my daddy and mother were there, here was, came in this great big, Oh, this great long line of Naga soldiers, 600, and, and uh, you know, just set, just settle in there for the night. And uh, Daddy, you can tell about that. That was quite a surprise here, all of a sudden, uh, to to be uh, enveloped by all these Naga freedom fighters. <laughs> yes, and uh, uh, <clears throat> we were amazed at first, uh, but when we found out that uh, uh, one of the uh, Christian leaders had been guiding them and telling them in, uh, in advance that they were coming into Christian territory uh, and uh, that there were uh, uh, Christian missionaries up here uh, from the uh, United States. Uh, why, we were amazed when they came in and they treated us like royalty <laughs> uh, and said, well, uh, here you have fled from the, uh, you, you're out here among these people uh, because you love them and you uh, are, um, have been uh, 
driven out from uh, Putao uh, by the uh, oppressive uh, Burmese government and uh, uh, of course they had that exaggerated idea because we didn't have any uh, any hatred against the Burmese government or Burmese people at all but they admired us uh, and uh, uh, they they said uh, we want you to send some uh, some uh, Christian missionaries uh, down to our country uh, in Nagaland and as a result of this contact at that time uh, uh, the uh, Satchaliya uh, and a number of others too yes and a number of others also Magalta Peter yes. uh, and you take it from there well there's uh, a Ram. number of uh, Lisu preachers, Rowan preachers, a number of others went down there, they reestablished the old, uh, the, the, the first a few congregations that had gotten scattered by guerrilla warfare, then that began to grow and expand, and just about two, three years ago, well, then uh, uh, we had, they had this invitation from way down in the heartland of uh, Naga country, that the wildest of the wild area, it took about 10 days travel further on, on into this wild area, and they came up and they begged our uh, people, they said, please uh, uh, send us uh, missionaries or teachers because uh, our folks want to turn to the Lord. Well, as it worked out, I think that this was as a result of, direct result of the testimony of these uh, Naga uh, Independence Army leaders. And, uh, you know, after they'd met us, they, um, they were headed for China. My father and mother persuaded them that don't get up connected, don't get uh, and, uh, in with the communists because we've already seen how it was. And I think as a direct result of that, they, they were turned off. I mean, they, they, they did go on over. They saw it was true, like what Daddy and Ed Reddy told them. And, uh, and so on. And so they came back and we have no reports after that of their ever linking up with the communists. And instead, uh, they went back, they more or less subdued their areas, uh, restored kind of a peace and, ca and uh, quiet within their warring villages. And it was then after that that they sent this re uh, request up to our uh, Lisu Rawang uh, Christians up uh, uh, near Hidden Valley uh, begging for missionaries. And so now uh, there are about, about around 15 or 20 missionary families working down in the Nakaland, way down in the heartland of that wildest of the wild. Jay Russell, you're 84 years young, and when we're talking about Hidden Valley, you're retirement age. Most people your age would have been considering sitting down and not doing anything, and here you were leaving... Uh, the fruit of your labors in northern Burma and wanting to go out and forge a new mission field in Hidden Valley or in northern India or wherever God would lead you. I'll never retire as long as the Lord continues to give me life and breath because I'm working for the boss I love. Uh, I never want to retire from his service. I just want to live answering that prayer, may the beauty of Jesus be seen in me and may I not only live beautifully for him, but die beautifully and go to a beautiful uh, heaven to be with my beautiful Lord. All right, I want to ask you a very personal question. Now, maybe I shouldn't ask this, but I believe Elijah was discouraged at the time. You know, he wanted to die. I know in my own heart that Paul was discouraged when he got down to Corinth and the Lord had to give him a vision that there were much people in that city. I know that Christ went into Gethsemane, uh, sweating blood and with strong crying and tears, praying unto him that was able to save him from death. I want to ask you, what was the most discouraged you have ever been in your years as a missionary? There have been uh, uh, repeatedly such times uh, when uh, we wondered uh, how much longer we were going to have to live, whether we'd ever get back to the United States or not. and. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, I think uh, the, the, the greatest shock that we got was uh, uh, during the time that we were uh, established our first mission station uh, and uh, we, we established a Christian school uh, in, in this uh, uh, village it was mixed Chinese people, tribal people uh, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, we had uh, had a friend in uh, in Batang, in, in Tibet. He'd been the postmaster there, and he was a Christian. And I'd corresponded with him, uh, and uh, as he'd gone back into China and asked him how he would like to come there and uh, work with us. And uh, uh, he, he, uh, he, he came, bringing his family, a lovely family, Eugene Tarn was his name. 
Uh, however, about the same time there came down uh, from, uh, from Bataan uh, some other Chinese, and one of these was the, had formerly been the, the chief uh, official magistrate or mayor uh, of Bataan. Uh, he and his family, his name was uh, Lui, and they had, uh, he had some of his uh, aides uh, came there, and uh, uh, in opening up this Christian school, uh, we, uh, Brother Tan and myself, uh, asked these folks if they, until another work opened up for them elsewhere, uh, if they would uh, like to help teaching in the school. Uh, and uh, they did this temporarily. But then jealousy arose because uh, uh, of problems of, uh, of support and uh, preeminence and one thing and another like that and also some questions. I don't know just how this... Uh, Mr. Lui's uh, son, uh, uh, Mr. Lui wanted uh, to uh, ask Mr. Tan for his daughter, oh, for his yeah. son, remember? And uh, then, I, uh, then uh, Mr. Tan says, well, this is their own uh, choice. Well, I can't, uh, I can't give my daughter. Uh, it's up to her, uh, the daughter to make her own choice. And uh, he was following the new Western ideas of, of natural choice. And uh, because of, uh, there was partly jealousy on that account and then partly due to uh, uh, jealousy on uh, uh, um, financial matters, too. Yes. Anyway, uh, and Mr. Tan, uh, was poisoned. I think his whole family at that time. Did. And Mr. Tanner was sick, yeah, and most uh, of it. and they went to church, and uh, the family were at church, and this uh, Mr. Lloyd's uh, henchman came in, and uh, uh, the cook was cooking some food for them, and put uh, some uh, poison into the uh, the pot where they're cooking the ch chicken soup, without the cook uh, uh, seeing it. And uh, later the whole family ate, but it was especially for Mr. Tan. He was quite, had been sick, so he ate a lot of it. And the, other fa the rest of the family ate a little bit. Well, the whole family came down sick, but Mr. Tan died. You know, when Moses led the people of God out of Egypt and into Canaan, I can see him in my mind's eye falling down on his face before God and saying, Oh, God, blot me out of your book, but save this people. Don't Amen. destroy these people. And I know that during your many, many years on the mission field, you've had experiences like that where you do get discouraged and you say, God, I'm praying for these people, I'm working with them, and here they are fighting among themselves. Here they are uh, poisoning one another and so forth. Now, uh, Ron has sat here quietly for two different sessions, and I'm reminded, Ron, of the book of Job where Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar had it out with Job for the whole book. And then when you come down to the end of the story, then Elihu speaks up with his words of wisdom. And so at this time, I want to ask you for your insight into the life of your father and your grandfather and your plans to serve the Lord. Well, I feel that personally, my involvement in the work began as a direct result of my grandfather and my father and the work and the, the things that they did affected me to make me decide that here was something worthwhile to commit your life to. Here was my grandparents, and especially I think this came upon me uh, when we were in the Hidden Valley. And I used to be scared to death because here were my grandparents, my parents were speaking, teaching, and I was 13, 14 years old, and one of these days somebody's going to ask me to speak, see. I was scared to death. But as I began to evaluate my life and what I wanted to do, and looked at what they were doing, I knew that I had to face up to it. And I asked God to help me and give me the courage to launch out when the time came. Well, sure enough, I was asked to teach Sunday school, and I said, here I go. And then I was asked to speak a couple times, and... Uh, You'd never really been to school, no, had you? No, no. You'd studied under your grandmother? Right, under uh, correspondence school. I went up to about the eighth grade and had to stop when we went into the Hidden Valley then. So I did my own Bible reading, and we had Bible study in the evening, in, of which I was in charge, and taught Sunday school, began to preach a couple of times in the evening, and about six months after doing that, I was asked to, to uh, teach in the Bible school, and taught two years in the Bible, daily, uh, daily Bible school uh, of our local Christian primary school for two years, four hours a day, at the end of which time we had to leave Hidden Valley. I was about 19 at the time. 
but the influence and the example of my grandparents and their commitment here was something that I could see firsthand. It wasn't that they were told me, we love the Lord, you know, we should commit our lives to the Lord. They were living it out. And one thing that a Lisu man told me affected me so much, even to this day, he said, you know, when you were in Burma before, in, in Putao area, uh, I knew that your family loved us Lisu and Rawang people, but now I really know, because you didn't have to stay here and eat this kind of jungle food and rotten trees and vines and roots and snakes and, you know, monkeys and this type of thing, but you've done it, and not only for a year, but almost five years now, and it went on for six and a half years, as you know. But this kind of a testimony from the native people impressed me, and seeing their example and their commitment to the people, not complaining. I never heard my grandmother complain or my mother complain, and this has had a real impact on me, I think. What do you think of when you think of your grandmother? She's been dead now how long? A couple oh, of years? Oh, about five years. Five years. Yeah, about five years. And I just regret, you know, that I was overseas when this happened because when we came back to the States, we didn't really have too much contact together after leaving Hidden Valley. And I regret that very much and appreciate the opportunity of being with my grandfather and learning from him and his insights as well. But my view of my grandmother was, when I was small, I was afraid. She was a school teacher, see, and we were always in tremble and tremble and awe of her because m mom told us, don't ever sass grandma. And if we did, we got our mouth washed out with soap. So we were taught in a strict disciplinarian style, you know, which I appreciate. I think that's necessary because people should have a holy respect for their elders. But uh, I learned to learn the other side of her too, the compassion, the endurance, the, the, the things she'd put up with and to go without for people that she loved. And she would give away, somebody would give us some, some eggs, give her some eggs, and she'd give us the eggs and say, you eat it. You need it more than I do. You're a growing boy, you know. And I thought, Grandma, you need this, you know. Uh, but it impressed me. I may not have taken it, but it impressed me that she thought about us rather than about herself. And the self-giving that my grandfather mentioned is something that is just has stayed with us, I think, all of us grandchildren and okay, will always yeah. be with us. You guys are going to be separated here in a few days and in a few short months you're going to go back to Thailand as a missionary? Yes, my wife and I will be leaving hopefully around the end of this year, uh, perhaps early next year, to go back to Thailand. I just graduated from Ozark Bible College and uh, principally will be involved in evangelism, training and literacy work, uh, teaching in Bible schools, using visual aids, whatever the Lord uh, Just like your father, us. just like your grandfather, following we'll, in we'll their steps. More yes. and <laughs> right, opening up new areas to the gospel. All right, now, and, more flowers for the living. Uh, how do you think of your grandpa, Jay Russell? What, what one thing uh, comes across that you remember? He never gives up. I mean, he, he'll never retire. And I think no matter how down we get, how, how discouraged the situation seems, he's always saying, trust in Jesus, always look up. And I think this has been the thing that has been the predominant thing that sticks out in, throughout all of our years. Never give up. And one thing that my grandfather always quoted, I think is a, could be a model of his life, that uh, uh, he said, a Tibetan, quotes a Tibetan uh, uh, proverb which says, the, the dogs may bark, but the caravan rolls on. And I think that's a fitting uh, word or expression to describe his attitude and the effect that it's had on our lives. All right, Jay Russell, we're down to about a minute, maybe a minute and a half. And there are people who will be doing this who are discouraged. They don't want to have any babies because times are too tough. They don't know whether to uh, put their money in the bank because they're afraid the banks are going to close down. We live in a frightened age of frightened people. Uh, give us a watchword, which will conclude this series of three sessions on a venture in faith. Uh, that's true. Uh, we need to have the experience that the Apostle Paul had when he said, I die daily. And when we can face uh, walk through the valley of the shadow of death and fear no evil for he is with us then we have a secret of victory and when we can when we can uh, in everything give thanks uh, and so crown our prayers uh, with the experience of victory in Jesus uh, that's one of my theme songs uh, and uh, uh, I, I we may at times fail and be or even be unfaithful temporarily uh, but he is always faithful, uh, and uh, we commit ourselves to, and all that we do to him, 
uh, and uh, trust in him, and he carries it through, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Amen. Thank you. Stay rest of the morning. We